And welcome back to uh, Face the Nation. Well, after Congress reached the last-minute deal to raise the debt ceiling and avoid defaulting on the nation's debt, the stock market took off. The S&P 500 finished with a record high Thursday. That was beaten again on Friday. But the deal only lasts a few months, and we could find ourselves right back on the brink early next year. So to talk about what that all means, we're joined by Mark Zandi, the chief economist of Moody's Analytics. Mark, uh, let me just ask you the basic question. Mm -hmm. How much was the uh, uh, economy hurt by this shot? It, it was hurt. Uh, by my calculation, it cost us about $24 billion in GDP. That's the value of all the things that we produce. So just to put that into context, it shaves about a half a percentage point from growth in the fourth quarter. And I had expected the economy to pick up pace uh, by the end of the year going into next, but now I think that's very unlikely. I think we're, we're stuck in this very slow growth, lackluster kind of environment. Well, I guess that uh, leads to my second question. Uh, does the reopening now, is that going to bring money back in somehow? Could it be recovered during the holidays? Uh, we'll get a lot of it back. Uh, you know, the, the shutdown was disruptive to lots of different parts of the economy, to trade, to mortgage lending, to small business lending, obviously to tourist destinations. But a lot of that will, will come back. But uh, I think pervading the entire economy is this uncertainty, which I think is the effects of that are corrosive, have been accumulating over the last several of years. And obviously, given the deal, the nature of the deal that we're going to take this into next year, it will continue. And what about the uh, just sort of how this is perceived uh, in other countries around the world? Does that have an impact uh, on, on the economy itself and our credibility? Yeah, you know, it does. Uh, I think global investors forgive us a lot because it's not clear to them where else they put their money. I mean, you know, you look across the world, would you put your money in Europe, oh, China? I mean, where would you go? So we're the beneficiary of that, but that only takes us so far. And I think global investors are starting to really doubt. When senators and congressmen actually openly question, you know, whether it's okay to default on the debt or other obligations. I think that makes people not only nervous here, but across the globe. And ultimately, that's going to cost us in the form of a higher interest rate. Well, do you think, uh, do you see anything changing since Standard & Poor's downgraded the nation's credit after the last uh, one of these messes that we went through? In, in terms of the political brinkmanship? No. I mean, I, this last round of brinkmanship, from, from my perspective, was particularly debilitating and disconcerting, particularly because we had people who are lawmakers actually openly debating whether we could, if not pay on the, on the debt of, the uh, of our Treasury, you know, pay Social Security recipients, you know, was this an okay thing? I, I don't think that kind of conversation is, is particularly useful and it, it makes me more nervous. Well, you know, when this was happening, and I've asked some of the questions that people answered by saying, oh, they're just trying to scare the markets and so forth, when I would ask people, do you really want to let the country go into default? What do you think would have happened? I mean, can anybody know? Because this is stepping into the unknown. Well, you know, Bob, I, I, uh, I, my job is to opine about a lot of different things. Uh, and some things I say with uh, less conviction than others. I can say with a high degree of conviction that if we go down that path, it's going to be cataclysmic for our economy. And, it, and not just for a month, two, or a year or two. This is going to extend out for decades. So we just can't even contemplate going down that path. And in my mind, the most important thing that could come out of this process is to all of us decide that we're just not going to do this again. Well, I think uh, the Senate Republican leader has convinced himself uh, of that. Yeah, and he sounded pretty convincing. So I think if we get a, a group of folks like that in the room and they're all uh, uh, coming to uh, even a reasonable, we don't, I, in my view, uh, grand bargain would be great. It, it'd be nice if we got that, but it's not necessary. All that's necessary is we have to decide that we're not going to shut the government down and we're not going to default on our obligations. And if we do that, the, the underlying economy is in pretty good shape, and that will shine through, and we will be in a pretty good place. Okay, Mark, I want to thank you for thank coming you. by this thank morning. You. We'll be back uh, with our panel of astute analysis. And now, for a little perspective on all of this, we turn to our panel. Uh, Runa Faruhar is the A Managing Editor for Time Magazine. Jerry Seib is the Washington Bureau Chief for the Wall Street Journal. Michael Gerson, columnist for the Washington Post. And Stu Rothenberg is the brains behind the Rothenberg uh, 
political report. You're also the body behind the <laughs> political report. I am turn the <laughs> <Rappenberg> political <laughs> report. <laughs> okay. Ruto, you just heard uh, what Mark Zandi just said. Uh, What's your take on that? You know, I, my opinion is very similar to his. I think that this round of fighting has been particularly debilitating. I think what was really interesting is right after we got a deal, the price of gold actually rose. Now, gold is a safety asset. That's what people go into when they're worried. And that, to me, was the markets telling us we don't want another kicking of the can down the road. We don't want to be here again in a few weeks. We want some certainty about the future and about what our economy is going to be like. And I think business CEOs in particular want that. You know, they've cut off spending. They're not investing right now. They're waiting to see what's going to happen, and now that's going to continue for another quarter or two. Jerry? Well, one of the things you saw in this crisis is uh, consumer confidence took a plunge. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that has significance in the real economy, not just in the Washington economy. And I think it's not because people are waiting for Washington to settle the budget per se. I think they're uh, acting on a sense of insecurity because they think things are sort of vaguely out of control. And I think that's one of the prices that's going to be paid here. One of the problems you have to think about is that is true heading into the holiday buying season. Now, you know, I don't know if there's a direct correlation between what am I going to buy at Walmart for Christmas for my kids and how are things going in Washington, but there's some relationship. And I think to the extent there's insecurity in the land already, Washington keeps uh, sort of reinforcing the insecurity security, the economic insecurity, and that can't be good. Michael, uh, you're now hearing some in the business community say that they may back candidates in Republican primaries against some of these Tea Party people who have been, you know, holding out the big club over the so-called establishment Republicans. Uh, where do you see this going politically? Well, I think that you've seen an epic disaster on the Republican <laughs> side, I mean, self-inflicted. Um, most Republicans realize that, um, except for the group that was decisive in the crisis itself. Um, this was a significant escalation of Tea Party strategy. It was not just directed against the leaders, McConnell and Boehner. Um, it was directed against conservatives who disagreed with their strategy, who were attacked in radio ads. That is a level of bitterness we haven't seen. The reason it's a long-term problem as well, though, is because Boehner really is not in control of an effective ma majority on some issues in the House of Representatives. Um, you know, Gingrich in 96, at least he could have a strategy. Mm -hmm. He could pursue, you know, tactics. Um, Boehner, because a significant portion of his, his conference is not on board, um, is limited in his ability to pursue strategy. Well, uh, Bob, so Bob, the problem with this is that um, that strategy by Karl Rove and others in the business community only gives ammunition to the folks at the grassroots. Sure, there's a Tea Party in Washington. There are a few dozen of them. But the problem for the Republicans right now are Republican grassroots voters. They're angry. They don't accept the institution, the legitimacy of, ins of the leaders. And so anything that looks like a, an organized effort by the quote unquote establishment uh, to uh, defeat the grassroots conservatives is going to be a problem. But, you know, you have an organized uh, thing going against people like Mitch McConnell. Uh, these uh, PACs, Tea Party supported PACs, uh, have run about $400,000 worth of ads already against Mitch McConnell, who's the Republican leader in the Senate. They run about the same number of ads against Lindsey Graham. You but, just but saw But sentiment Lindsay at the grassroots Graham. is a little different than sentiment in Washington, D.C. And at the grassroots, the Republicans, the conservatives, are angry. At least the people who vote in primaries are really angry. So it, it's. It's hard to motivate establishment support at the grassroots. There is some of that, particularly in the business community, but the Republicans have face a problem at the grassroots. But well, you know, go ahead. Well, one thing that I think is interesting, too, though, in the business community, a lot of things that business wants these days are actually sort of left-leaning. Infrastructure spending, uh, investment in K-12 through education, which poses another sort of interesting challenge for the right. Uh, Jerry, but, but I was going to say that the, the, I think Stu's right in the sense that you know people at the, in the Tea Party movement are not mad at Obamacare because the exchanges don't work. That's not the point. They're mad at it because they think it's a metaphor for everything that scares them about government intrusion in their lives. It's it is almost a, a symbol of what they fear most, mm -hmm. which is that Washington is going to come get me. And that's very basic, and it's very Tea Party, and it's got nothing to do uh, with sort of the debate about how well it works here. But let me just add one thing about uh, Obamacare, which. Uh, uh, Senator Warner, uh, as he was leaving, what he wanted to say, and we just wanted to run, we ran out of time. Uh, he says, and the White House uh, is saying the same thing, 
that despite all the glitches, despite all the bad publicity about this start, that when you look at what's happening at the state exchanges and you look across the country, uh, that about a half million people have begun the process uh, to enroll. Now, mind you, uh, this thing is not very pretty the way it's unfurled, uh, but uh, they, they are really wanting everybody to well, know I, that. I would say, though, that when you look at the economics of this, the worst outcome is a partially working system. Because if you persevere and you really need health care and you go on and on, you get the, you know, to the site, you're getting people who need health care in the system. Mm -hmm. The goal of a health system is to get millions of people who don't need health care in a system. That's the way insurance <laughs> works. That's called adverse selection. That's the real fear here is a year from now, if the system's not working properly, how will the economics of that system work? Well, I want to go back to this this situation in the Republican Party. Is there a war now? Is this a war for the soul of the Republican Absolutely. Party? Absolutely. Unquestionably. I, it's impossible to argue against that. At the grassroots level in Senate races, a number of incumbent senators have primaries. McConnell, Lindsey Graham, Lamar Alexander, now with Thad Cochran of Mississippi. There's some House primaries. There will be more. No, there's no doubt. And it's going to be a civil war that continues past 2014, probably all the way to, through 2016. So where does this go? I mean, well, if I were a Republican, this is what I'd be worried about. This is the number out of the shutdown that w would worry me the most. In our polling, mm -hmm. between September and October, the, n the number of independents who said they wanted Republicans to control Congress after the 2014 elections dropped 20 percentage points in one month. So that's the problem. There's a civil war underway. The Republicans are fighting it out. But what are those independents who really tip the balance? What do they think? Now, in the Tea Party districts, these Tea Party representatives, they don't have to worry about that. They are solid. And the calls they got from back home said, hang in there hang tough. But there are a lot of other Republicans who don't have that luxury back home. They're the ones who I think need to be worried. You know, I think that there are also deep policy issues at stake here. I mean, there are the politics of all of this, but I think economically in particular, Republicans need new answers. They need fresh answers. Supply side, I think, is broken. We've got growing inequality. We've got a pretty long-term, slow-growth economy. We need some new answers and some fresh thinking that people can really buy into. Yeah, I strongly agree with that. After this last election, there was some reflection, self-reflection. The RNC issued a big report. How do we appeal to young people? How yeah. do we appeal to minorities? All that is washed away in this populist revolt. The real cost here for Republicans is the opportunity cost. They've got problems to solve in their appeal to the American people, which they're not solved in, in this internal debate. Would uh, you worked for George W. Bush. Do you think he would be acceptable to the Tea Party? Um, no. <laughs> I think that they would certainly agree with that. The, but the problem here is you have people like Senator Jeff Flake, people like Tom Coburn, Senator Tom Coburn. These are some of the most conservative members of the, of the Senate. They're not acceptable well, to the Tea uh, Party. Well, Dan Cochran, right. Mississippi. Right. And, and this is largely an argument about strategy and tactics. But it's a bitter argument about strategy and tactics because the critique here is that these people are compromised. They're at, you know, Georgetown cocktail parties. They're part of the problem. Um, that is a bitter debate going forward. And the Tea Party itself is, lives increasingly in an ideological bubble with conservative media, with the support of conservative organizations. They don't view it the same way as the, as the party does. Bob, I was reflecting on my interviews with candidates over the last two cycles. I interview House and Senate candidates about 150, 200 a cycle, and uh, interviewed a lot of Tea Party, Libertarian candidates. And uh, they would come in and we'd talk about their strategy and what they want to accomplish. And I'd ask them, what, what do you, why are you running? They said, we want to do away with Obamacare. And I'd say, I, I understand that, but you understand that the President's not going to allow that, the Senate's not going to allow that. What do you really, what do you hope to accomplish? We want to do it with Obamacare. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, uh, now reflecting, it says something about their understanding of the legislative process and their role in Washington. And they have such a different view. Uh, Michael's exactly right. This is not about ideology. It's about strategy, tactics, and uh, understanding the nature of the institution of which they're members. One of the things I think people don't understand is how much of the House is made up of members who've only been here a few years. You know, about half of them have only been here since 2010, which was the year of revolt against Obamacare and revolt against uh, the president himself. And that's increasingly true in the Senate. So I think a lot of, a lot of the folks in that group don't, didn't come here intending to legislate and don't really think that much about how does the legislature legislative process work, they're here to run a kind of a campaign against things they don't like. Over time, people say, well, you know, that sort of smooths out. People figure out how to do legislatively what they want to do. But that's not where we're at right now. The Congress is not in the hands of people who have that kind of experience. 
Well, let's uh, talk about the country. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's always the country. Uh, what's going to happen here? Are they going to be able to come to some understanding? I think both parties understand they're in a different place than they were before all this happened. But will that be enough, Luna, you think, to get people to seriously sit down and try to you know, find a way out of this? I, I would like to think so. I mean, we're, we're in for, as Mark was saying earlier, another probably year of a 2% growth economy. People are really struggling. But I think one thing um, is that the markets have not sent a really strong signal yet. We haven't had a market crash, for example, around all this. And part of that is because the Fed is always stepping in because of political dysfunction in Washington and pouring more money into the markets. And you know, the Fed is sort of the last man standing that can do something. So there's a strange disconnect where you, you want to almost get a lot of pain, not that I'm wishing for a market crash, but you might need pain in order to get people to really respond. And, and you have these two things going on at once that can offset each other. Well, this be enough, do you think, uh, Jerry? Well, I was interested that Senator Lindsey Graham seems so optimistic there's a deal to be done. I have to say he's in the minority in saying that. On the other hand, there's one thing that drives the two parties together, and it's the sequester, these across-the-board automatic spending cuts. Both parties hate them for different reasons. Republicans hate them because defense spending will take the entire next cut early next year. $20 billion comes straight out of defense. They don't like that. Democrats don't like it because it's held down discretionary domestic spending so much. And so in that space, I think there's room to do a deal. And that's essentially what Paul Ryan, in some ways, yeah. has been proposing in, the, in this system, a reasonable voice saying, let's lessen or ease the sequester in exchange for some m marginal changes in entitlements that'll save money in the long term. That's a realistic deal. The question is just, what's the market for rationality right now <laughs> in, the, in the Congress? Um, and it's pretty thin. Yeah, I would say the House is still a problem, and for Republicans, think about this. After the deal, we heard some people say, well, maybe this is the beginning of a period of compromise, of where we're all, we had this tough fight, now maybe everyone will work together. If you're a Republican, you've already caved on a pretty big deal. Are you willing to cave again on immigration reform or a big budget deal? Yeah. I'm not sure why. I'm sorry, I was going to say, immigration is the one word we hadn't mentioned until Stu just did, but you remember, that was going to be the big deal this year. That's what Republicans said. we got to get around in front of the immigration debate. That was the beginning of the year message from Republicans. Well, that's kind of been washed out. And I personally find it very hard to imagine in this poisonous atmosphere, the two parties coming together and doing a big immigration deal. And that's something that business, again, would really like to see. Yeah, you know. absolutely. But uh, this is kind of interesting to hear both you, Rana, and, and, and both Jerry, and you're very close to the business community and their points of view. Uh, is business cooling on the Republican Party here? I think so. I think, you know, it, the Republican Party used to be the party of optimism. You know, it used to be the bullish party. Uh, it's really not anymore. And I think that getting that mojo back is going to be very, very important uh, to regaining the confidence of business and also coming up with a real agenda that works for actual businesses in America. You know, you need infrastructure spending. You need a rethinking of education. And that's real hard policy work, and that's hard politics. I don't think they're breaking from the Republican Party. I think they're breaking from what they see as a Tea Party domination or potential Tea Party domination of the Republican Party. They're not running toward President Obama and the Democrats by any means. But you saw the Chamber of Commerce say, in the end, Republicans should vote for the deal that ended the shutdown. Meanwhile, the conservative Tea Party groups were saying the opposite. That, I think, illustrates the split. It's which kind of Republican Party. Could there be a third party come out of this, too? Is there some way, some sense that maybe the Tea Party people would just say, there's nothing here for us in the Republican Party? Well, I never say never anymore. Yeah. And I've, <laughs> I've seen it all, and there's something else will come around the corner. Having said Sign that, institute. <laughs> Yeah, institutionally, it's very difficult to get a third party, just the nature of our winner-take-all districts and the fundraising and the uh, personal loyalty. I think it's possible we might have a kind of brief fracture in the Republican Party. I can see a, 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 a cycle where we have a number of independents who are or conservative independents running, but uh, something something more dramatic would have to happen in terms of uh, legislation and how we run elections before. Do you think that the Republicans party. might lose the House next time? Could they? Or um, Let's do numbers again. We have uh, 24 Republican districts at significant risk, or 24 districts at risk, 12 significant, 12 marginal. Some of those marginal races could move into real risk and some races that are off the board could move. What I've said is six months ago it was not plausible to say the House is, is at risk. Now it might be. Give me two or three months and I'll tell you whether I think it is at risk. 
Yeah, I think getting 17 seats is an uphill battle for, for Democrats in our, the way our, our districts are gerrymandered and, and our, our current system. Um, I don't see the signs right now of a wave election, um, you know, what you might see, but I, you know, it is, it's early. We'll see how this works out, and of course it, it'll unfold early next year again. If Republicans to repeat you know, silly tactics like this, they're, they're on a downward path. Um, if they take a different path, I think they'll have a different outcome. And this is being said by someone who worked for George Bush. This is <laughs> part of the Barack Obama team that's here. <laughs> very, and thank you all very much for being with us this morning. Uh, very interesting. I learned a lot. And we'll be right back with our Face the Nation flashback. And finally today, as Washington recovers from a crisis of its own making, it is worth remembering the 51st anniversary of the very real Cuban Missile Crisis, our Face the Nation flashback. A CBS News special report, Anatomy of a Crisis. It was October 1962, the height of the Cold War, and a U.S. spy plane discovered Russian nuclear missiles on the island of Cuba. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. In a televised address, President Kennedy announced a naval blockade on all shipments to the island and demanded the Soviet Union withdraw the missiles. Should these offensive military preparations continue, thus increasing the threat to the hemisphere, further action will be justified. Americans prepared for nuclear war, and the American military went to the highest alert. 90 miles away on public beaches in Key West, a startling reminder that we meant what we said. Rockets, where days before there had been nothing but sun and sand. This just part of the Florida buildup that must have appeared so menacing to Khrushchev and Fidel Castro. For 13 long days, the U.S. stood its ground, working through back channels to facilitate an end to the standoff. On October 27th, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev sent word to the White House that Russia would remove the missiles if the United States agreed not to invade Cuba. The crisis was averted. It was unimaginable that just a year later, President Kennedy would be gunned down during the campaign trip to Dallas. Back in a minute. And that's it for us. We want to thank you for being with us this morning. We hope you will stay with CBS. We hope that you will uh, catch CBS This Morning, tomorrow morning, with Charlie Rose and Nora O'Donnell and Gail King. They'll have a very latest. That's it for us. See you later.